Welcome to Malcolm Reed's How to Barbecue Right, a podcast where we talk about barbecue, share recipes, and discuss all things delicious. And now, here's your host, Malcolm and Rochelle Reed. Hey, welcome to the How to Barbecue Right podcast. I'm your host, Malcolm Reed, joined by my lovely, talented wife, Miss Southern Shell. Shell, how you doing? Good. Ready to, um, to jump right into the podcast this week? <laughs> um, we've uh, had another busy week. They're all busy. They're but different. this week, we didn't actually get to record um, a video, a uh, cooking video, because we had to do some traveling. We were invited by the Certified Angus Beef uh, folks up in, what was it, Worcester, Ohio? It's right outside of Cleveland. Kind of like a, I wouldn't say a suburb because it's real rural where we were. It's kind of farm country, Ohio. But uh, they have the Certified Angus Beef Culinary Center. Is that what it was called on the mm-hmm. building outside? It was the whole and, operation. The Certified Yeah, Angus that's their Beef headquarters. Operation. Yeah. And they invited, they had a barbecue summit. Where and what it mainly was was it was a group of uh restaurateurs, social media influencers. Um that's Just, basically it, yeah. right? It was probably about thirty five, maybe forty people with thirty six, I would 36. say. Because they broke us up into six groups of six, wasn't it? And how it worked. And uh, what they did, they kinda introduced us to what certified Angus beef is all about. I mean, we got the history of it, we got to see them breaking down sides of beef to all the primal cuts we got a bunch of good food cooking mm-hmm. and we got to go out to a farm and so we just wanted to talk this week kind of all about our experience there yeah. and what, what we did i mean i found it fascinating and we learned a lot so i thought you know we could, other people might find it fascinating Man, how, how, <laughs> if you was interested in beef how could you not yeah. i didn't know what all went into i didn't even realize this. yeah i didn't even realize what certified Angus beef really was. In fact, um, I kept calling it the beef council. Yeah. And I, I, and I guess there, there is, there the, is. No, yeah. I think the, you know, the beef council, I think it's kind of like the government branding arm for ranchers, cattlemen, all that okay. stuff. Certified Angus beef is kind of a brand inside, um, of the, of the beef industry. And so if you think of Smithfield pork, um, you know, Swift, Swift does beef and pork, things like that. But aren't, isn't like, um, isn't a Swift or, or more or more Smithfield? Aren't they actually the pork brand? Certified Angus beef just and the it, producer, yeah, yeah. They, they are. So it's certified kind of, Angus beef is more of the quality control aspect of it uh, for that brand. For so, that so, brand. so what they did, uh, just a what from what I gathered back in the late seventies, um, there was some guys. They weren't even they they were cattle farmers. They were smaller scale raising Angus cattle, and they realized that. There was so much bad beef out there. Remember, they told us a story of yeah, where like one of the story. one of the owners had went to a restaurant, they, and they ordered a. <coughs> they went to the restaurant. They ordered Excuse Angus me. beef off the uh, off a menu because because he, he raised Angus beef. Yeah, and he and he thought if this is what's passing for Angus beef, if people are ordering this and thinking this is real Angus beef, we're in trouble. Yeah, <laughs> and so so he called one of his buddies that was also a rancher. A farmer and you know in Ohio, um, I think that's where they started, and they got together and formed the Certified Angus Beef brand to uh, to help other Angus beef farmers, you know, basically control what they yeah. were doing as a as a breed. They want they knew the Angus breed was really good. They wanted there to be some standards in the Angus breed so that they could get, you know, guarantee that better beef was going to market. Yeah, up and above and just your choice prime, whatever yeah, the government. So, yeah, yeah, select choice prime. That's how it was graded out. Still is to this day. But so what makes theirs u- unique? I mean, there's a lot, there's a ton of Angus cows out there. Angus cows or black cows are predominantly black cows. Um, you know, there's other breeds. You got your Hereford, you got your Holsteins, you got all these other, you know, all these other breeds of cows, just like pigs. But the Angus is one of the best tasting ones. And in the certified Angus brand, they hold them to certain standards to even be considered Angus. It's not just, you know, we got this cow and it's going to be a certified Angus beef cow. No, it, it depends on when it goes to market. First off, they, um, they have 10 qualifications. Well, okay. Yeah, there's 10, uh, 10 criteria that make them a certified Angus beef that they have to meet when they uh, process. And what they say, three out of 10? Make three out of ten Angus cows actually make, make the certification. Yeah. The rest of them are right. sold off to other brands. 
Like it could be, you know, you could take that and it end up in Walmart or something just because they don't sell certified Angus beef is where it really wasn't that, you know, sort of, it didn't meet the highest quality of the Angus breed. One thing, you know, I kind of, I didn't realize that when I saw something labeled in the supermarket as Angus beef, I didn't see any difference between the one that Ang- labeled yeah. Angus beef and the one labeled certified Angus I didn't beef. know there wasn't much of a difference, you know, because you see like Walmart has black Angus. Then you have other people that are selling just, you, you see the word Angus used all the time. Yeah. And, but it has to be certified Angus beef to really be that. Uh, particular high standard brand. And so the ones that stood, stood out to me of their 10 qualifications was the age of the animal. They have to be 30 months old or less, no more, no less 30 months. They have to, the carcass weight has to be below 1050. That's 1050 pounds on the, you know, hanging weight. They it have says, to have, I printed out the quality. Oh, you printed, printed them all yeah. out. Oh, well, what, the other one was the 10 to 16 inch rib loin. The, that's the size of the ribeye. It can't be so, under 10. It can't be over 16. Okay. They're looking for specifics. So they actually take their Angus cows and take them to, to a processor. Right. And then once they get to the processor, then those Angus cows are graded out. That's it. Correct. And then, okay. you know, so I think they said and there three was. Three out of 10 of those seven, was it seven processors with about 19 plants across the United States. Or are, are processing certified Angus beef. Yeah. Now they're processing beef for other brands too. The, you, you know, USDA might have some stuff in there. You might have Swift. You might have, you know, Meyer, all these other brands of beef that you see out for, for retail sale and that restaurants are using are processing in a lot of these same processors. Yeah. But they grade them as they process them. So as they come in, say that, you know, you got your, Side of beef hanging there. They'll look at the loin. They'll know, okay, this, this loin meets the criteria. The ribeye is t- between 10 to 16 inches. The weight was right. The animal was aged right. There's 10, The fat content. What, what were some of the other total. ones? You want to go over just um, a few of them? High marbling, uh, medium or fine marbling because you want white flecks instead of just big, big fangs and veins yeah. of fat. Yeah. Um, only you said that thirty months of age, uh, ten to sixteen square inch ribeye area, uh, ten thousand fifty uh, pound hot carcass weight or less, less than one inch fat thickness, superior muscling, um, practically free of capillary ruptures. What is that? I guess that's injuries due to when they're processing. Oh, okay. You know the blood, the those vessel vessels, blood vessels or veins have been busted, and you can get bleed out in the meat. They don't want it. Mis- that just means it wouldn't mistreat. It wouldn't bruise. Yeah. It wouldn't, you know, there shouldn't be any discoloration in, in the meat because of that. And these are just higher standards that they came up with. And no dark cutters ensures the most visually appealing steak. I don't know what dark cutters is. It's probably when they're processing, processing cutting out processing. each muscle that they did, they did it right. You know, that the knives were, the knives or the hooks or whatever they used went in and, didn't damage the other cuts taken off the brisket or okay. cutting out the yeah. rib loin. Or, and no neck hump exceeding two inches. And see, that goes into like uh, the breed. They're looking for the oh, best of the right. Angus. So the, what are the bulls, the chalets that have the big humps on them? Yeah. So, you know, they don't necessarily have to be 100% uh, Angus to, to meet the criteria, but they have to be predominantly Angus. And so what they do, they, they just make sure that they're trying to keep that breed as strong and as pure in there without being a hundred percent. They keep their know. quality up. They, they keeps were their quality real, up. they were real, real big on quality. That's all. That That's was what they good, were striving. Yeah. Now the certified Angus beef doesn't actually sell the meat they process. The, I guess the ranchers this, get paid for selling it to the processors. The processors get paid by people buying, you know, bid out for that's going retail or restaurant or wherever it's being used. But the certified Angus beef just gets like a percentage of total sales or something like that. Two cents a pound. For every pound of that makes the black Angus. And so what yeah. they do with that money, it's a non-profit. non-profit. Yeah. It's a non-profit organization that's just, they're really working for the betterment of the breed, for the ranchers, for the, you know, the processors. They're working for everybody, even for us as consumers, to make sure that there's a standard. That, that their meat is held to. When you buy that, when you go out to a restaurant, you see it on a menu, or if you go into your retail stores and you see the certified Black Angus brand, you, you know, know you're, you're getting some, quality. Yeah. And I thought that was, you know, that's something that I learned and I picked up and away I from it. I just, I didn't either. I had no idea. I've seen the brand. I recognize it and yeah. knew what it was. I've and always I've heard of cooking CAB a brisket or yeah. you know something like that, but I didn't, I didn't put two and two together that, oh, that's like buying Hormel 
or you know something like I'm buying a specific or comp art. That's a good example. Yeah, comp that is a good, better. Yeah. So it's so you're, you're buying you know you're higher, higher quality, quality beef when you when you look for that certified Angus beef brand. Or it's like buying you know the expensive purse. You know you <laughs> yeah you're getting a little bit better quality. Yeah, you're getting a better quality. Love it. You know we always see the beef on the plate. We always see the beef in the meat cabinet at the butcher shop. Um, so, on the menu. Yeah, on the menu. And and you see that certified Angus beef sticker, but you don't really think much about it. But they kind of explained how it, you know, how they get the genetics from it, how they how they work with the farmers, how the processing goes down, you know, the whole aspect of it from start to finish. So it was nice to see that other link in the chains, you know. What I thought was cool, you know, we went out to a farm one day. And I don't want to sound like I'm advertising for since yeah well, we're not <laughs> we're not Angus i just beef. like the quality that they're doing yeah but what i thought was cool is so we got we got to go out to a farm one day and meet some ranchers that were growing it and they, this wasn't like and the farmers have so much pride in the fact that they're growing certified angus beef oh yeah know? yeah well they weren't you know th- this wasn't thousands of heads of cattle operations this mm-hmm. was ohio farming and the one we were on was a genetics farm, and I didn't, you know, I, I didn't know much about cattle farming. There, I didn't know there was just genetics farms. So instead of raising there the cows they had that we saw, they weren't like being fed out and sent to market. Yeah, well, they their were coals do. Yeah, yeah, they were. But that's, they're, they have a small feed out farm, right? Yeah. So that what they were doing, they were growing the best they could. They had their cows. They, you know, their heifer before they have a calf. Once they have a calf, their cows. And they would Steers, bulls, buy yeah. the best um, insemination, the you know, the Genetics, semen that they could yeah. put in, the, that they could artificially inseminate these cows with. And they they did them uh, twice, so they were buying yeah, I the found best. That interesting. I did too. This was cool. Did they say it was no? The whole gestation period or their whole mating season or whatever you want to call it is what ninety days. They tried. They wanted to be l- no more than ninety days because okay. they want them to all calf at the same time. Yeah. But that was typically they've always made it to under ninety days. I yeah. guess a cow comes in, you know that. It's, how how it's, many days did they say that? So they said they twenty one, twenty one or twenty seven or something like that. Twenty eight days, I think. Yeah. So twenty eight days they inseminate them. They come in the heat, they inseminate them, and then if they don't take, if she comes back in twenty eight days later, it didn't take. They do it one more time, and if they don't take that next time, they go ahead and put them in there with the old cleanup bull. <laughs> <laughs> and that's his job. You know, they had, they said you needed one bull for every 16 cows. And so they had, um, what they had three or four out there. I didn't count the yeah, head they I'd had. I've always was, heard that you can't put bulls in the same pen. Those bulls were happy. Yeah. They, they knew they weren't going to market. They were just the old cleanup guys. <laughs> they, <laughs> they were perfectly fine. That's the happiest bulls and cows I've ever seen, man. Did you see, I mean, they were eating, they, yeah. eating their lunch, more breakfast that morning. These, <laughs> that, and I said that if, man, if I was going to be a cow, this is what I'd want to be. Yeah. Put me in the genetics program. I just, <laughs> that's my job just to make better me's. That's all they do. <laughs> that's all they do. That's the life there. You know, you think of cows that they just, you know, they're raised, uh, you know, 18 or what is it? 30 months and they're going to slaughter. Yeah. Not, these old girls are, they were, there were some of them were old, you know, that as long as they keep producing, they, they were fat and happy. Yeah. And so they were but, raising bulls for their genetics and selling some of them. Yeah, uh, you could have bought one of their bulls for what was it three thousand dollars? A young bull or something like that. I, I, I thought that's pretty good deal. I, I, just, I, was, I hadn't been bull shopping <laughs> yeah, lately, but uh, that sounded right to me. I was like, man, just give me sixteen and one bull. Maybe I can start cattle farming. Yeah, but I, I liked that operation. That was pretty neat. We learned a lot there. But um, they so the, their heifers. Um, they have them, they grow them, and then they sell the heifers off to other yeah, farmers. Yeah, that's what that's what, how it works. Yeah. They were so they sell theirs as stock for other people that's going into the business. So what you're doing, you're wanting to have, you want your whole goal is to have a cow every eighteen months, whether you know it's a steer or or uh, a heifer or whatever. Because I guess they if they don't want to turn them into bulls, they castrate them, mm-hmm. and then those would go to feed. Yeah, they would to send them or they have a feed barn there where they would feed them out, and they kept so many. Because as they're kind of culling their stock, getting the best of the best, instead of just selling them, they would take them, feed them out, and then they would send those to the to the slaughter. But what what they were doing that, not just to get rid of them, they were doing it for the info that they got back from the market because they could see how they were grading out. You know, if the genetics they were buying and producing and then they fed that out or they sold it to somebody and they shared back the data with them, that they could they could see you know they could see their whole operation yeah. it was like getting it, they, the the farmer best described it as just like getting a graded test 
before, you know, you take the test. Yeah. You can see the answer to what's happening. So they're seeing their science and their program behind by the fact that, you know, 90% of whatever they're doing, a, high, a super high percentage was being actually making that certified Angus uh, grade. And that's what the whole goal is because it pays more. Um, you know, if, if your cow, if you're raising a cow that can, that can meet that certified Angus brand qualification when it, when it goes to market, you're getting a little more money for it. Yeah. And to and me, it's probably costing you a little bit more to raise them, but they also, um, they acted like, uh, they didn't come out and say this, but they acted like it was a very, you know, it was a pride point for the farmers because they had, could follow the higher regulations and they could do oh, the yeah. better thing. You know, they had the better farm too. Well, and it, I mean, it was. They didn't a, say that, but that's uh, the way I kind of felt like. I don't know. You grew up around California, so. <laughs> but your granddad raised certified Angus beef down yeah, in the city. And I never really put the two and two together. Yeah. I mean, it, it was said, but it never, I had, I still didn't know. Yeah. And you would think I'd have more of, maybe I just didn't pay attention. Well, I mean, hey, I've been around barbecue for a long time, but I didn't really know much about the farming aspect of yeah. it. You know, that's the one thing. And that's what I thought was cool that we got to learn. But we also got some good food. That was cool. You want to talk about yeah. the food part well, now, or you want to, you want to wait and talk about that last and talk about the breaking down part because that kind of goes next, I guess. We uh. Well, we arrived Monday night. We it was a fast trip. We we jumped on a plane Monday morning, um, and we came back Wednesday evening. Mm-hmm. So it was a pretty quick, two days. Yeah, um, we arrived Monday night, and they had a big. They had you know some beers and drinks and stuff, but they had a bit like a charcuterie board out yeah it was kind of a charcuterie cocktail hour I yeah. guess. that's what it was I, you know that was one of those little th- the treats we had was the best thing i tasted all weekend i hate to say that <laughs> they had taken well, so different it was like a tomato pepper the chef described it so if you imagine like a little cherry tomato but it had a pepper like it was a pepper it just tasted like a cherry tomato yeah it was real soft had it hollo- hollowed it out softer had it stuffed with or was that was it pickled at all? Because no, it was it really soft. Was, you know, a pepper's got yeah, more of a texture. I don't, I don't think it was. Maybe it was kind of pickled. I don't, I don't know. know. I'd like to know that. Yeah. But it was stuffed with a goat cheese that they had mixed in some beef tallow, beef fat in the goat cheese and added some smoked salt in there. So it had really this great flavor inside that little tomato pepper. And then they served it with some honey. And like an endive leaf or something, some kind of crispy green leaf. So you kind of ate it. That was kind of the spoon. Mm-hmm. Then you picked it up and you had the sweetness, the richness of the goat cheese, the smokiness and the beefiness of, you know, the beef tallow. It all just went. It was a and perfect man, little bite. That was one of the best things I had. <laughs> and they hit that off the gate. And I don't even think that many people tried it. But when it he described really it to me, I was all over it. And the other cool thing, I mean, they had, they had oh, all, how many all, different all, kinds of Beef sausage did they have? Cured sausage. There was like salami, Seven, mortadella, um, pepperoni. I mean, this was all in-house stuff they made there. All beef with all beef, and it was it was good. Using man. beef fat too. Yeah, in the no sausage. pork fat. It was no beef and fat. beef fat. That was a big thing. They, they didn't use any outside meat, so everything we had there was certified Angus beef. And um, and they had one of these cheese. I called it a schmelter. I don't know what it is. <laughs> that cheese was so melter. Cool. It, I looked up one on Amazon. I almost bought it. It was like it was you know what? It was kind of like a, it was kind of like a beefer element <laughs> hanging <laughs> yes. on, the, you know, coming up and over a cheese wheel. Like a half a cheese wheel, wouldn't you say? Yes. And you could take it and swing the cheese out away from the heat, and then you could swing it back and melt the top and he was scraping it and putting it on little baguettes, you know, oh, toasted gosh, baguettes. So oh, was, that was unbelievable, man. I got one. I could make myself cheese sick off I that think you were so. <laughs> I think you were supposed to, like, you know, get your little toast, and he was going to put the cheese on it and hand it to you. And then I think you're supposed to put stuff on it and make, you know, a little cheese toast. Yeah. I just ate it cheese and toast. Yeah. and I, I, I did put a little sauce. No, they had did. all kinds of little pickled things. Yeah, and, you olives. Know, and yeah, olives. And pickles and, yeah. Bruschetta type stuff. I mean, it was, it was really good. Yeah, it was an excellent charcuterie. Did you get um, a... You put I, a picture of that on Instagram, I didn't did, you? I it did. was on the story, I'm sure. It's probably gone now. Everything um, was very. If you, if, if you followed our story last week, you got to see all this firsthand because we tried to do a bunch of bunch of pictures and a bunch of videos. But everything was really like the presentation of everything was really top notch. So 
I want to say how many employees was it? Sixty employees that have, were working there so, total. Yeah, and, I mean that's their headquarters. So they had an office building and they had this culinary center. And in the culinary center, they there must have been a dozen, half dozen at least chefs that were on staff when we were there, wasn't it? Um, I would say there was three or four. Three or four, and pl- well, plus the book, the meat cutters, the meat yeah. science lady. That I mean, there were so there was a lot of people in there. Was and then all their social cutters, media people yeah. and photographers and all that. So that was all neat. But um. So what was for dinner Monday night? Do you remember? Well, that was just what, what we're talking about. Well, let me describe this place first. So it's a building. You walk in, and then it's like a big um, meeting room kind of, but it's set up for a cocktail hour. There's a full bar on one side, and then there's like this wood panel, and there's you know TVs over it so they can do presentations. And they had the charcuterie table out in the middle. Um, and then we didn't know it, but right behind that panel was this like a, a full kitchen? show kitchen. Yeah. I would call it a show kitchen. It's like something you would see them doing a, a food network show thing or something where they it's were going to put multiple one shelves. Big island. Yeah. One big Island, the whole wall of grills and ovens and uh, deep fryers and things behind it. And then when they pulled this, the chefs were back there working. They pulled those panels back, and then all of a sudden we had this huge display. I mean, they had one of those cowboy cauldrons hanging. It was in the middle of it, hanging yeah. up with whole uh, rib loins on it. They had, um, well, the food that we had, smoked prime rib. Then we had uh, spinalis, which is the best part of a ribeye. They had rolled up stuff with lobster. So we had those <laughs> pinwheels. And then at the very end station, the chef Tony was cutting up tomahawks. I mean, yes. I don't know how many, how many do you think he could? I don't know. It was a bunch. The, the tomahawk was the best and they were beef like, of that particular that, that night. Yeah. Uh, you know, the spinalis with the lobster was okay, but it seemed like it was a little overdone. I agree. And then the smoked prime rib was on point. It was. I mean, it tasted it had a good, really good too. Smoke flavor. It they was said between it was the prime rib. a little, wasn't it? Mm, probably so, I imagine. They, that was, you know, the chefs. And that was a big thing. They were putting every, you know, they were grill marking stuff and they had smokers out there. But all the beef was, it was bold. <laughs> no, it was CV. <laughs> a lot of it was. I mean, they didn't put it on the menu. This, the, what well, we had for lunch one day, it was sous vide. Uh, Not flat. everybody has the version of sous vide. Chuck Flap like or do. something? Yeah. Oh, no, they love it. You know, yeah. It's a way to not put flavor in anything. <laughs> all your flavors in the back end. <laughs> I would have loved to cook some of that stuff on the smoker yeah. and grill and showed them what it really could taste like. <laughs> Because the beef was awesome. It was just, you know. I I, I will have to say one thing. Um, and I know I like my beef pretty rare, but most things that I had were overcooked. Yeah. To my standards. You Mine know? too. But I think that's what you do when you're cooking for a large group Masses, of people. Masses, you yeah. don't know. Yeah. I don't know. Some of the temps, like, it's like, man, they're taking that too high. Why are they, why are you going to 140 on beef? I was like, man, we should have took that out 20 degrees ago. Mm-hmm. Let's let that carry over to to, to medium rare. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, exactly. That's There's, why. Hey, that's why the they have different bite, degrees of doneness yeah, for different foods. Yeah, the only foods. bite I, I had that was a good rare piece of beef was something somebody sliced and said, "Oh, this is this this isn't done." And I was like, "Let me just take take that just, to the side. Let me just yeah. take a little bite of that." <laughs> so that night after we had dinner there, we we kind of went to the hotel and crashed because we were traveling. Mm-hmm. And then the next morning we had to be back early. It was like. 8 a.m., what, 8 15, something yeah. we had to be there. And they was, that's when it all started. Cause the first night was just kind of introducing everybody. They didn't, I don't even think they did a spill, did they? Yeah, they but, did like a welcome. Yeah, it wasn't much. Yeah. It wasn't much. But it was just, it, it was more your welcome ceremony, your welcome dinner type thing. The next day is when we got the history of the, you know, what they do there. Well, the first thing and, we did was it broke down a cow, right? Well, that, you know, they kind of gave us the introduction. Yeah. Told us all the history of everything they did. And then they split us up into groups and took us back into the back. They had like, you were on a team of six people. Our team was uh, Dr. Barbecue, Ray Lampy, yeah. Barrett and Kent Black, and Barry Sorkin from Smoke in Chicago, and then me and Michelle. Nobody you've heard of. Yeah, nobody, nobody <laughs> you've heard of. Yeah, nobody knows this. I team. mean, this, there was a that lot. That was like of- a super team. <laughs> <laughs> they split us into a super team. But like, everybody Man. there was like a big Oh, name. yeah. It was. Lily, 17th Street, you know, Heim Barbecue, John Fox Lewis, Brothers, Fox Brothers. The, uh, Christi- the cult- Chicago oh, Culinary yeah, Kitchen. The Garbos, I mean, yeah. it was, it was awesome. Yeah. It was awesome. I mean, they, could, they couldn't have got a better group. Yeah. And so we, they split us up and took us back. We had to put on these chef coats, aprons, gloves. Uh, you had to have a hat or a hairnet. 
Yeah. And it was this wasn't like they were reselling this stuff. No, but this they isn't just, a factory. This is a learning center. They brought so. in six sides of beef for us to play with. It's actually seven because she cut. Dude, out she one. cut up one too. So that's amazing. You know how much beef? I mean, you know how much it is. You saw it, but it was incredible <laughs> that when we, we walked in this place, and did you get a picture of us going in? Like it's a, it's I this. Did. It's basically a big refrigerator room mm-hmm. with tables, and it's of course they have the rails where they hook these sides of beef up and roll them in and out. It's super cold in there, yeah. so you're kind of glad you had on chef's coat and and all that stuff, but. They, the they gave us a quick cold, lesson on man. knife work. To they didn't want anybody to gut themselves because we were. I mean, we're dealing with some serious, serious equipment here, <laughs> and so we get. It in, wasn't as much equipment as I expected it. Well, it was six it was some, knives and some hooks. Yeah, and a big old saw. saw. Yeah, yeah. that's it. Yeah, that's all we needed, really. Yeah, there wasn't anything electric. It was all manual. Yeah, which I appreciated because I mean, you really got to get in there. And what they did, they had it split up into two sessions. The first session dealt with. The front quarter, you know, think of the ribeye loin up all the way up to the neck. That was first. That was the first time. The first day. The second day was the hind quarter, dealing with the loin, uh, sirloin back, kind of, you know, pretty much. Um, and that one was intense. The, <laughs> that's where, but they both were. I mean, we broke it down. What they had, um, Diana Cook. Yeah, I think Diana. That's her name. Yeah. I don't remember if that's her last name or not. I know her, everybody was calling her Doc. She was great, yeah. She was, she was the food science lady, and and she was, ma- like a master butcher. Yeah. And she, she was a kind of a small, you know, girl, and she was I had, ter- She was tearing into stuff, man. <laughs> she was ripping off things that, I was like, how is this little woman doing that? I was amazed. Because she was, she was like, yeah, just, just cut it out just like this. And, man, and then me and Barry get the saw, and we're like, wow. Ah. <laughs> It's all you can do to get through some of these cuts. I was like, man, she made that look easy. But so what she did, they had a TV screen set up in there, and she would make the cuts and show us, okay, you're going to count down six ribs. We're going to split the, you know, split the animal here. You come on the other side, make a cut, and we're going to cut the ribs out from there. So you got your plate ribs and your chuck ribs and all that. And so every time she would do a cut, she'd stop, and then she'd go around making sure we were weren't screwed it up too bad. Yeah. And we, and so it was super hands on. Yeah. That's what I thought. I mean, I had a fun. I jumped right in, and we all kind of took turns. Even you did some cutting on it. So Not really. I mean, you, but you did a lot of filming too. I was filming. Kind of. So that was cool. I mean, I enjoyed the experience. That was really neat to actually get to see where the brisket came from, you know, because it was just this big hunk of cow and it slowly became the cuts that I was familiar with. Right, right. Took a while to get some of them there. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but it turned me on to some new cuts that, that I really wouldn't know to look for or that, I mean, some of them you never see in the grocery store because some of them I'd never heard if, you know, of them. If, if we hadn't heard of them, majority of people probably yeah. haven't heard of them, you know, as far as from a retail consumer standpoint. Yeah. And I expected, I completely expected there to be some stuff that I wasn't aware of. I just didn't realize it'd be so much. Yeah. I thought I what you could get more. out of some cuts mm-hmm. and what, what, you know, what intrigued me was the lesser cuts, the ones that, that, that Diana said, you know, these are as good as ribeye. If you take the time and trim it and out like this, and doing. you know what you're doing. Yeah. So, eat, and, and so they would tell you, it was like, Trace Major, she's like, this is the best cut on the animal. That was the one her husband loved. And she was sick of it because that's all he wants to eat is Trace Major. Yeah. And and they actually took it out and they hand it off to the chef. He goes out and cooks it. And then they bring it back and you get to get out and get you a bite of it right there coming and, off. I mean, it was. And he just cooked the meat. He didn't do anything else. Yeah. To so it. you were tasting yeah. the beef. And it, it was, tasted really yeah, good. Yeah, it was. If they had pulled it off. 20 degrees sooner, it'd have been amazing. <laughs> <laughs> it's a little overcooked for you. That's all right. I don't mean to be down. Those chefs are awesome. They really were. They're just overcooking it. <laughs> They're just overcooking <laughs> it for my personal taste. Yeah. Well, you like stuff on the rare side anyway. I do. That's what I'm saying. I'm not, I'm not trying to, you know, put these chefs down because they were amazing. And they did some awesome, you know, awesome food. So um, after. Especially their sausage. I was highly impressed with the sausage. How long sausage. did it take? So we started breaking down the front shoulder. It took a while. Probably at 9 a.m., 9.15. And it took us until 12.30, so four hours probably, mm-hmm. to get through breaking thing. it down. I you know, And then... Um, and you had to like hang it on the hook and then keep... I mean, keep breaking all the yeah. way down. Well, there was nothing but bone and the tendon holding that bone mm-hmm. on was all that was left when we were through. Yeah. And so I asked her, you know... If you wouldn't teach the people how to do this, how how fast could you possibly break this down? 
She said she could do both of them, the front quarter and the back quarter, in one hour. Every cut spread out. So that's fast as she's ever done it. In, in one, one hour. hour. I mean, all those cuts, front quarter, back quarter, in one hour. Can you imagine that? Uh, that would be that's, rolling. <laughs> and that's not making any mistakes or you yeah, know, no, not having just, a struggle. Just doing it. Wow. You know, I've seen here, I mean, it's been on Facebook, but I think it's over in Australia at some of those big contests, those meat stocks and things they're doing. They have a competition now of breaking down meat. It's not cooking it. They just took That's it cool. out. And it, yeah. man, wouldn't you like to go to that, yeah. a butcher competition like that to see them break it down? Well, that one time we saw, um, Newman. Yeah. Chris's Chris brother. New- Chris Newman's brother. His older, was his older brother? I or thought it was brother? his younger brother. Yeah. He's a meat sure. science guy. Uh, Is he? Um, but, uh, you know, they constantly they raised. Uh, Newman Farms Port. Yeah. And he did, what was that, Koshan 555 we were he at? He did a demo in front of everyone where he took a whole hog, a mallet, and a hatchet and broke that hog there down in such a way. It was like art, you know? Oh, yeah. It was, it was so cool and he did it so fast with just this mallet and, you know, you gotta have, you gotta be real sure about your cuts when you're breaking it down. Hitting like it with that. the mallet, yeah. yeah. I mean, no saws. I don't even think, hey, nice. It was just the mallet mm-hmm. and the, and the hatchet, wasn't it? And he broke it down and, and bundled it up in butcher paper. Tied Every it. cut. Yeah. yeah. I want to go to that one of those so cool. butcheries yeah. where they start out with the animal live and they take it and do everything to it all the way down. Really? Yeah. Wouldn't That's that be awesome? Thing? Yeah. Where? Yeah. Here? Um, in America? <laughs> yeah. Now, they do a lot of them down in Louisiana. And, um, oh, is that one like of what the, Phil Wingo does? Yeah. He goes to, yeah. he goes to one down there. And then there was one of the, one of the chefs from a restaurant over in South Carolina. I think it was, was it Chris from, I can't remember. I, sh- I got his card, but I can't remember his yeah. restaurant's name. I think it was in Greenville or Charleston, but he said they have one every fall. And he's like, man, you got to come. And so I was like, next year, Let's I want to plan on going to one of those boucheries. That'd make an awesome video. Yeah. But that, so after we did the meat thing, we kind of broke for lunch. Um, man, what, we had was, a, what was lunch on Tuesday? That day. Do you remember? Yeah, that's where they had that split shank roasted, and it was kind of Asian style, and they had these little bone meat. Is it bon me buns? Swig and swine. I think that's it. I think that I think that's the name of his restaurant. Where does yes. it say it is in Greenville or <laughs> yeah, just Charles? Oh, yeah, but, but it, um, it was Chris from Swig and Swine. Yeah, yeah. Was it Chris? I think so. Yeah. But anyway, they had we did like um, they had these little bon me steam buns. And they had the Asian slaw, and then you just, they had the shank. Oh, the split yeah, it was family shank, style. Yeah. yeah. Sitting out there, and you just got tongs, and they had the butcher paper open where they had that wrapped up, and you just dug off in there with the tongs and got you out some of that meat and put it on one of those little steam buns and then dressed they it. They had a slaw that was delicious. The Asian slaw. That was one of the best things I had. They had. That was really good. The other one was the. Um, I want you to do chuck a roll. recipe like that. They did, they the cooked the chuck roll, which is the cut that I saw. I was really interested in. I'm going to. I'm gonna. I'm gonna do that, Shell. Remember, I looked up those those little steamers. I can get them on Amazon. I got to get a recipe Let's for the dough, up. and I'm gonna do those. But I thought they'd be good with pork steam buns. You know, so yes. you could do beef and yes. pork. Yes. So, so if you're doing a dinner party, and you had that, you had like some Asian style beef, and then you had some Asian style pork. You could even do pork belly. Those would be awesome in them. You could do all kinds of things with that. Um. But we went, they they also did a chuck roll. And if, I didn't know what, I've heard a chuck roll. Honestly, I've never seen one for sale. And in in I think Restaurant Depot may have them, but like a regular grocery store doesn't. But the chuck roll was pretty much when we were breaking it out, I was like, man, this is where I want my steaks. If I'm mm-hmm. at an SCA, I'm wanting chuck roll steaks. And what it does, the ribeye, the loin, the rib they, loin, where, where the ribeyes come. Stop that r- the ribeye. It breaks off at a certain rib. And it keeps on going up into the neck of the animal, up on the shoulder. And that's where those best, those try heart cuts come from. And so you can get that chuck roll a lot cheaper than you can buy a ribeye for, for at a, you know, at a grocery store, at restaurant depot, mm-hmm. wherever. But your best meat is right there in that chuck roll. And so what they did, they, they cut it out and it looks like part of a primary ribeye, yeah. you know, rip roast. Just doesn't have any bones on it. And then they took it and cooked the whole thing whole and shredded it. And that's what they made those little tostadas out of. It was kind of Mexican spices and all that. Those were really, really good. Yeah, they were really good. And the other thing they did was the, it was a sous vide flap, chuck flap. And that was kind of, to me, it was kind of like, I don't know, London broil 
or something like that. It didn't have a lot of marble. It didn't have a lot of fat. It was just kind of a, it was like a flat iron kind of, mm-hmm. but, but not as flat as flat iron, a little bit thicker. So it kind of looked like a roast. And when they sliced it, they, they sous vide it, perfect temperature. And it was cooked. It was more on the, it was. the rare side than anything yeah. else. But it was still, I mean, the flavor was just on the outside. There, you know, yeah. I, it got beef flavor, but yeah. man, if that would have been smoked can and you then take done like that, that would have been awesome. Can you take that chuck roll and trim it out real good and cook it like a prime rib? Oh, yeah. Heck yeah, Let's you could. I want to see It'd what be it's real like. good. And, you know, a lot of times they could do that. Steaks. They do that for prime rib and like, like casinos and things yeah. like that. Where they're doing, or if you see a prime rib buffet, a lot of times it's probably like chuck, chuck roll, roll or something like that. Yeah, yeah but it might be. It's probably better, yeah. honestly. Because I want to find out. I want to know. You get that tenderness of where that spinalis starts up in there, and that's, I mean, that's what's so good about it. I know. It. That's when I was feeling of it, and I, and I was like talking to Ray uh, about it. And I was like, man, I feel the tenderness of this. You can feel each one of those muscles that we call it try hard. I don't, I don't really know the proper. I didn't even ask what the proper terminology of it. Nobody, I don't think nobody was impressed with the chuck roll except me and you. <laughs> I was like, this is where it's at, man. I, I want that. If I can take that home, I, you can keep the tenderloin. I want that chuck roll. And another thing is, those guys are restaurant guys, so they might already know about the chuck roll. Yeah, probably so. it, you know. I mean, a lot of that stuff, I mean, I guess some of them are used to dealing with or buying and doing it in the restaurant. But me, it was all, that, that that stuff was new to me seeing it in that form. Um, after lunch on Tuesday, we kind of toured the whole operation, saw the offices. Um, you know, the one thing that I thought was really neat, not only do they have, like, they have a studio, real studio, like an actual real filming studio. Yeah, you know? with all the lighting and different sets. Wasn't that cool how the each corner was a different set of the room? Yeah, and so they can do some really high-quality filming in there. They've got, like, the recording studio. they got a photography, you know, studio. Full-blown, like, high, filming high, kitchen, high high-end kitchen yeah. that was set up for commercial one view or industrial, I guess, or yeah. what you call it, restaurant style, the other view. And then that they was had cool. like, you know, one for that would look more like a kitchen at home. And, you know, uh, they also had like a whole graphics department, and a whole printing shop, and they would print your menu. Like, help, if, you design help you design it. your menu. Um, I imagine they work with butchers and small restaurant, you know, independently on butcher shops and restaurateurs to help them design menus and, and, any type of advertising you want or any type that you of, might yeah. Need. You know, I thought that was unique too. Cause uh, one of the guys that was in our little group, as long as you're group, selling their certified Angus beef. Yeah, yeah. Had the, and he was selling certified Angus beef on his menu. And, I, and he's like, yeah, they did the menu. Here it is. And so I looked at it and the only thing you would have known it was certified Angus beef was when you got down to where his steaks or brisket was and had the little logo. And so the rest of the menu, they'd done a whole menu and just had one little. You know, yeah. thing. I was like, man, that's cool. You know, they can't because it wasn't. I expected. You know, you know how people do. They'll plaster yeah. their brand all <laughs> oh, over yeah. your stuff. You know, that was. But they I, kept saying we we want to be a resource, so they allow their people who are restaurant owners, butcher people, to come in and use their studio and use their pictures and use their footage and whatever, whatever they, they, need. they need. Yeah, to, to help better their business and promote the brand. Yeah, but they kind of work. They do the same thing with farmers in a different way. Whatever they need, they you know provide yeah. the resource for. Whatever the end user and the you know the, the retail sellers are doing, they they provide whatever they need to. If it's the science behind it, the yeah. the talking with other farmers, seeing how the market, yeah, that, that was what I took away from it the most is yeah. how much they help. Um, it's not it's not like oh we just want you to jump on board. And tell everybody they got to buy certified Angus beef. No, it's not. They don't care. They I mean, they, ultimately, very, they want you to sell it. Yeah. But it's more of a it. lifestyle to those yeah. guys. I mean, they're really working towards something to you know to, towards bettering everyone that's involved with it. And that was cool. Yeah. Because ultimately, that where we what they do is marketing. They're just trying to market certified Angus beef, that breed of you know Angus cattle yeah. for everybody, the best of the best. Whether they're it's the education. rancher. Marketing, hospitality, the chef, yeah. the end consumer, everybody. That's what they're trying to do. Um, then and they're doing a good job of it. They are. Well, I didn't know. Yeah. Well, <laughs> uh, you say that, and it's like, yeah, we didn't. This new, new stuff come to light to yeah. us. So, you know, if we, if we didn't know, how many, how many put other people out there don't know? You know, that was what, and that's what we had a conversation with. Uh, um, What's her name, Margaret, from there. And we were talking about, you know, 
this is all new to us. I mean, you know, of course I've heard of CAB or yeah, certified English. I just B, didn't realize but I didn't know what level scale or standard. Scope, yeah. Yeah. What they were actually about. And man, that was cool. That was worth going to us. I thought, you know, I took away so much from that, but that was the main thing that I took away was what their, you know, their overall message of what they're trying to do. And I get it. I'm on board. I like it. Yeah, I do too. That's what I mean. They ain't paying us to talk about it. We're just talking about it because we like it. And I'm going to go. You take me out there and feed me beef. I'll (laughs) I'll sing your praises. (laughs) Well, I'm going to look for some certifying beef this weekend and make sure that I buy that. Not just USDA Prime or something like Costco has or something like that. Because I realize that it's really, truly a higher quality of beef. And the thing about it is a lot of it is not that much more expensive. I mean, you shop it just like you do anything, but you can get a lesser cut and pay less money for something that's better than the next guy's ribeye or, you know, choice or prime grade. Yeah. And that's what impressed me when they showed you, you know, what you can do with this chuck cut or what you can do with some, you know, the, a lot of the lesser cuts. Yeah. They gave a lot of ideas. Yeah. Like sirloin. Is, How yeah. many different cut steaks can be cut out of that sirloin area? Even their tri tips. All yeah. of it was marbled and looked so much better than some stuff you see. Uh, then after lunch Tuesday, you did a sausage, learned about sausage. Different uh, recipes, yeah. what they, you know, what and they made used. Some to, sausage. Mm-hmm. And I think that was more of for the tech, the restaurant guys. Cause yeah. a lot of those were, you know, I'm, in, I was interested in sausage making. Don't get me wrong. They had some cool recipes and some new things they were working on, like that, uh, what they call it? Faux boudin or fake boudin. It was on there that yeah. night, which no. was no, blood sauce, fake blood sausage boudin or something. Yeah. They called it something barely boudin. Or, ba- yeah. Yeah. Or, Cause it wouldn't. Yeah. It, I mean, it was, they used the fat to look like rice and they used a charcoal. Activated charcoal to give it that blood sausage look. And it did look like blood sausage. Yeah. Or, you know, and so I thought that was neat. And then they she co- said she didn't want to do a blood sausage because it's really hard to get beef blood, blood in there. Yeah. yeah, yeah. And she was just didn't want to do a beef yeah. blood. <laughs> <laughs> but she came up with another one um, because I think Christine and Greg had said they wanted to try to make a sausage, a beef sausage that tasted like a hamburger. And man, they put pickles in it. They put, I mean, she made up this whole onions. recipe, onions, yeah. and it tasted when they, they had, so we had to make the sausage and then let it sit overnight and then, you know, stuff it and let it dry. And then, then they cooked it the next day. And some of it they smoked, some of it they just grilled. That hamburger was when they just grilled off. It tasted just like a White Castle yes. hamburger. I mean, dead on. And it was so good. I thought it was very good. I thought it was very good. They did, um, who would have thought that? I mean, there was a, Green chili cheddar. Yeah. Was it was, the green chili cheddar? There was one that, um, I think that's what it was. Hatch, was it the sweet hatch chili cheddar or maybe. something like that? It was really good. I was re- highly impressed with the quality of sausage and how good it was and how moist it was when you're not even using pork, you know? Yeah. Yeah. I've always thought that you had to use some, some pork, pork. fat. Yeah. yeah. And, you know, that lady touched on that, that this sausage would be better. <laughs> you know, if you're in a restaurant and you have access to, you're doing barbecue. You have access to pork trimmings. By all means, put those in your sausages. Yeah. It's going to make it even better. Because beef's harder to work with. Now, she said, did say the closest thing to pork fat that she could use was that like brisket trimming fat because it melts. It's a better. She told about the six different kinds of fat in the cow. You know how different. How saturated? Yeah. yeah, she said it was less saturated or more saturated in the brisket. I don't. I that, was an, I, that was that was interesting, but I was had learned so much, and cool. it was like I, I should have been taking notes. <laughs> then after lunch, um, there was a rest. Went back to the hotel room, and then we did dinner that night. And that's where we did the sausage and beer. Yes, they sausage lined up all those sausages. They cooked them. Had a presentation. Uh, um, Christina Garbo from Chicago Culinary Kitchen did a beer pairing. Mm-hmm. She is. They they said she was something is. I kind of got the impression it was like a sommelier for, for beer, beer or something like yeah. that. Yeah, she's working on her degrees, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. so she paired this beer. And I'm a, I love, uh, I like beer. You like beer. I like <laughs> beer. Who don't like beer? But I'm kind of a, I hate like the IPAs and the fancy beers. And give me a Coors Light, Miller Light, Bud Light, uh, domestic beer yes. lover, <laughs> Budweiser, even. DVL, domestic beer lover. So I'm a little bit like. Uh, we're going to have the fancy beers, yay. You know, I don't care. Yeah. I liked every single one that she picked out. They were really? very, very they good. Were good. Yeah. They were good. They were good. The one that had, it was kind of a sour, and she said they used, was it lactic acid in it or something like that? And it gave it a, it went with one of those sausages so well. It was, um, 
the pastrami sausage, yes. wasn't it? Yes. Gr- that was Girls Can Grill. Yes. Yeah, yes. Yeah, was her name Christy? Yes. Christy from Girls Can Grill was there. She uh, she's from Vegas, I think. Yeah. And she had brought a sausage. It was a pastrami sausage where she had used corned beef and you know did all the seasonings and cooked it or whatever and then turned it into a sausage. It was really good and it paired well with that beer. She had a smoked beer too. I'd never had that, but I kind of liked it. Was it? Yeah. It was. It reminded me almost of drinking like a bourbon or. A, I know. tried all of them. I thought they were good. I'm, you know. You don't. You're like me. I'm. Yeah, I will drink them, but and there's. It's not, I don't, I don't want to sit down and drink a six pack of those kind of beers. Yeah. I mean, I can drink one or two there. If I'm going to drink beer, I'm going to, you know, give me a Miller Lite, a Bud Light. Give them a case. Coors Light. Yeah, I want 30 Watch pack. it disappear. I have a bushel. <laughs> a bushel. <laughs> I want a bushel. <laughs> um, then we had a Woodford after dinner and went to bed. Yeah. That was another, we were, in, we were in bed every night by 10, 10 30. We were tired. Heck I yeah. Break I down do a cow. Night. Working on a cow takes it out of you. Um, then Wednesday morning, we went to a working farm. We had breakfast on the farm. Um, they did a... That was cool. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> there, was Chef Tony beautiful. from from the Culinary Center, yeah. he was already out there, and he had these sirloins that were cut into kind of like fillets. Yeah. Little round pieces, and he had some pitchforks, <laughs> and he was taking those sirloins and skewering them on these pitchforks, and then he had a cauldron of peanut oil. Was it running about three fifty? I didn't even look. I should hit a thermometer on the side. I didn't yeah. look. But he would take the he would take the uh, pitchfork, skewer it with all the sirloin, stick it off in that peanut oil, and hold it. And he said it took two and a half minutes to get it down. He called it beef fondue. Yeah, beef fondue. So if you think of like a fondue restaurant where you put your little skewers in the meat yeah. and the in the hot oil or whatever, that's what it, it was. It was farm style. And then he'd take them out and take them off and cut them up. And they had the little smoked salt that we were seasoning with right there. And man, that, that was good. What did they, what was, what sauce was they? What, oh, they it was a it? beef tallow Bernay sauce. Beef tallow Bernay, so, which is basically beef fat and mayo. Kinda. It was the best. Yeah, it was. You loved it, didn't you? I knew you'd like that because it was like a beefy mayo. It was. Ooh, man, that's such a good idea to add some, take your, if you're, if you're, Trimming ribeyes or whatever, keep that fat, render it down. You know, it's easy to render. Just put it in a pot with just a little bit of water to get it going and render it till it all liquefies. Pour that up in a jar and you can add that to mayo. Who knew? Yes. You and know? It's delicious. Oh, man. You can add it to all kinds of things. They added it to goat cheese. You thought mayo was delicious? Imagine <laughs> some, imagine some <laughs> steak bombs, you know, the jalapenos, cream cheese, but you then put some beef fat in the cream cheese. Oh, there man, it would be go. so good. There you go. It would be so good. Let's but then, see. so they took the beef fat one step further and were frying. They had another cauldron set up with peanut oil, frying donuts. And then they took, instead of just like a regular sugar glaze, they'd mix some of that beef fat up in the glaze and had those donuts fresh out of the oil, glazed over the top. And, man, that was incredible. It was good. And once again, Christy had the idea. She took it, made it, she did it. It's a good Instagram post. She split the donut open and then stuck some of that fresh cooked sirloin on it, put the Bernay sauce on both sides of the donut and made a little sandwich. I'm sure she put that on her Instagram. She did. She made a whole little video with it. Oh, did she? That was cool. And um, you have to share I that. asked her, I said, how was that sandwich? She said, I only took a bite. I was like, what? What'd she do with it? <laughs> I guess it was just a little too much. The, the only thing that was a little strange was they had all the cows feeding them breakfast right there where we were doing this, you know, because they were going, they were teaching us. I and so like the that. cows were sitting there watching you eat <laughs> <laughs> other cows. <laughs> but they but they didn't mind because they're just the genetic cows. They knew they weren't yeah, going to be yeah. there. That'll never be us. Maybe our offspring, but that was pretty cool. They did have the cows right there. I loved that. They were just that was there eating their yeah. breakfast. Uh, and, and the people who owned the farm came out and gave, you know, explained a lot of things, but just explained what they do, mm-hmm. you know, and how they do it. One thing that I, I was impressed with is she said, um, her name was Mandy. She said that some of the cows, they can grade them before they ever kill them. That was, they can grade them alive. They come out, they shave them, and they use an ultrasound. To see what kind of marbling they have yeah, in their yeah. so get, get an idea of the size of their loins and the marbling they already have. So that's the, that goes back to those 10 qualifications. Some of them they get before they ever go to market. They know, okay, you know, this one's going to meet that. Mm-hmm. Or 
and I'm sure they're not doing it just for market. They're doing it just for their genetics. So yeah. they can, the ones they get off there can sell to other farmers that are going into that business or improve their herd. And then, um, we came back. And talked about the hind quarter. We were short on time, so we didn't actually get to break the hind quarter down. Yeah, they, had they already them, had it broke down and, and had everything and, sh- and put it. She kind of put it back together. Yeah, and that was cool. Puzzled, puzzled it back together so we can see how they all come off. The most interesting cut off that that I didn't know. What was that? It was right above the knuckle. It was almost. It looked what like do they a call roast. it the ball. Of yeah, knuckle ball, ball knuckle or something yeah. like that. That was ball yeah. roast maybe. I've never seen that. Yeah. Yeah. That would make such a good pulled pork. Oh yeah, and that's yeah. pulled beef. Yeah, that's, Pull, I'm sorry, pulled beef. That, yeah, and that's a lot of that stuff they're recommended for that. Yeah, and they were saying there was even one cut. Man, I want to say it was sirloin cap or either. I can't remember exactly what cut it was. Now, as so we talked about so many, but they said there are times when brisket has gotten really high in the past. The restaurants had switched to that cut because it was so similar to a brisket, and even looked like a whole brisket it when did. they had it pulled out. And I was like, man, I could see that. And she said, no, it doesn't eat as good, as good as brisket, because it doesn't have as much fat in the point in the fatty end like a brisket would. Well, she said but it. But it eats more like flat. Yeah. Is what, the whole thing eats like flat. Yeah. Is what she said. So that was it. I thought that was really interesting. That'd be a good test, you know. Yeah, just to compare those two. Yeah. I got a lot of ideas from, you know, videos to do there, too. different different cuts. Yeah. So as soon as that was over, they let, had all those pieces laid out that we done you know all the primals laid out and we drew numbers to see where we were going to pick and we were cooking lunch that day yeah our groups your group was responsible for one cut so we drew like number seven and the number it was close we were third pick and we picked um culotte which is picanha sirloin you know the the little cap with the fat yeah and we had now what did we cook six of them i think i thought it was more than that i don't know it was a tray full of them yeah we cooked, we uh, seasoned them. I mean, kept it simple, trimmed them, seasoned them. Um, uh, Dr. Barbecue made an awesome compound butter. We put that over them when they come off the grill. We smoked them for a little bit, then threw them on the green egg and kind of seared them, broke that fat down. Um, you know, I we say, struggled because we ran out of time and whatever. they were, they I were about perfect. I wasn't trying to yeah. cook. I cooked yeah, I made time. a quick chimichurri to go yeah. with it. So we did a board sauce with the chimichurri. Slice those up, put them on a platter, and they had the melted compound butter over the top of them. I thought they were good. They went under a heat lamp because everybody was kind of putting their displays on, uh, you know, this countertop that had these heat lamps set up. So it played in our favor to have them undercooked because by the time they sat under there, they finished off yeah. and they were pretty dang good. It's kind of hard to have six people cooking one cut of steak because any of these people could handle it themselves, you know. Yeah. <laughs> so- <laughs> well, I had the idea we were going to. You know, put them on a, a skewer and just rotate them over. You know, yeah, because they already had that thing going right there. Yeah. And then Ray's like, "Man, let's throw these on the egg." And Barry said, "Well, let's put some smoke on them first. So we did it all. You know, <laughs> and then we ended up having to throw them on the jar griller at the very end yeah. to finish them off because we got pressed for time. So it was a, it was a quite a show <laughs> 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 for us to get ours done. But they turned out good, man. I thought they. I mean, I might be a little biased, but I thought ours tasted better than anybody because they actually had some flavor to them. Yeah. You, know? you had the smoke and you got the, you got, you got the, the soup char. was really and, good. Somebody made a soup. Yeah. The Fox Brothers did that. Yeah. It was really good. They picked the femur bone and boiled it down. I don't know how they got that soup that much flavor in it in the time we I had. Know, it was like, so they two must have hours? had some, there must have already been some stuff in that yeah. refrigerator they added to that soup for bone broth or yeah. something. It was because, good. Yeah. I saw a post Nobody, of it. I didn't have anything that was bad. No, I didn't either. Yeah. There's some, the tacos were really good. The tacos uh, were skirt, good. Those, was that skirt steak, outside yeah. skirt? And um, and then the Garbo's uh, team did. Oh, they did that sirloin cap, which was a lot like spinalis. And Greg told me they take it and kind of butterfly it where it opens it up, gets it thinner. And then they tenderize it. And then they skewer, uh, marinate it in bulgogi, which is like Asian, think of Asian flavors. Mm-hmm. And then... They skewered those in strips and put them on and just let them spin Brazilian on the, style on the Churrasco grill. And that, that was good. Yeah. That was really good. I didn't have anything that was bad. Those are the ones that kind of just jump out. You know, I didn't get to see. And they had a macaroni and cheese that was really good. Amy and her team, um, what's the, Chris from, was his nibble, nibble me this? Mm-hmm. Uh, they were on a team and they did the whole tenderloins. 
They did them like three ways, and one of them they did the snake. They caught. Did you see that? Uh-uh. They cut the chain off of a whole beef tenderloin, mm-hmm. and they had it like coiled on a platter. And you don't cut it up; you just clean it up. So it's the chain, and it kind of, you know, it's about the size of a snake. It looked like a skin snake. And then he, you know, after they did their presentation, they cut it up, and you got to try. It. Really? But that was. I wish we'd have got I that. I didn't get that. a picture of it. I didn't get. I didn't get a video of it. But it was pretty. That was like the last. You know, they were group six or whatever, and everybody was trying to. At that point, we were all yeah. ready to eat some more beef. <laughs> And we were all, you know, we had fl- flights to catch. It was all kind yeah, of rushed. That, the, the I wish we'd have, yeah, I wish we'd had another. If we could have finished out that day and then flew out the next morning, that would have been more ideal. Yeah. But because we were rushing at that point. But. I have to say, I love Doctor Barbecue. I'd never really hung out with him much. Or Dude, Ray's a cool guy. Yeah. I mean, he's got such a good story and how he got involved and in things he's done. Man, it's incredible. I really want to uh, get some. Interview with him or do a recipe he's with him. He's going to be at Memphis or, in May. Yeah. He's cooking the hospitality the podcast stuff. or something. We'll see. He's doing the hospitality tent, Big Green Egg, I think, must be sponsored some kind of way. And he's coming, he told me he's coming out and cooking some stuff and schmoozing, I guess. Well, we're over our time. Are we? Well, was there anything else? Uh, we'll talk more about, I'm sure I want to start cooking some more certified okay. Angus beef. So yeah, we'll be talking about this in the future. Yeah. And, um, Coming up, we're getting ready for Memphis in May. Yeah. We don't have any more contests between now and then. We did. Oh, we did hop and uh, have a layover in Atlanta. Yeah, we, we hit the varsity up for some hot dogs. That's my first varsity hot dog. Chili, chili cheese slaw dog. I That's what it. I had. Good. I had two of them. They were good. And the what was the orange frost? It was okay. Orange freeze. Well, yeah. that, was pretty, that was pretty good. It was. Tastes like push up. It did. It tastes yeah. like a melted push up. The first sip was good. After that, it was like. Yeah. So we're gonna Sweet. do some, we're gonna do some videos next week. We'll be back with one. Yep. Um, I'm not gonna to give too much away, but you're playing with some bacon. Yeah, it might be some bacon centric. Yeah, if and you then, don't see anything else about bacon, I've also got to work on my well. turkey recipe for because um, the it's, it's a turkey federation or some <laughs> federation of turkey people. We're Our to sponsor get in Memphis and May. <laughs> no, they're sponsoring Memphis and May. It's a category, <laughs> so they're giving us like two turkey breasts, and you got to come up with a recipe. Um, the Thursday of Memphis in May and I signed up for it. So I'm going to go ahead and film my turkey practice video and I'm going to release it the day <laughs> that I'm turning in that, that entry. So I don't know if it's going to go or not. I got an idea and I'm hoping it films out well and I'm hoping it does well in the contest. It might be a and blooper. So it might be, it might be what are they, a blooper reel. A fail. A fail. <laughs> yeah. How not to do turkey right, but we're going to give it a best. And, uh, that's about all we got coming up, man. These new, next two weeks are going to be crazy. So. Yeah. Uh, y'all follow us on Instagram, uh, Twitter, Facebook, <laughs> probably more like Instagram. So we're going to try to do some stories and show y'all what we got going on for yeah. Memphis and May. But it's going to be a lot of fun. And if you'd like to uh, connect with Malcolm, it is how to barbecue right, how to BBQ right at Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, and of course YouTube. If you'd like to connect with me, it's Miss Southern Shell on Instagram and Twitter. We'll see y'all next time.